We are back. Lenny Randall's Hot Corner with the host of the show, Lenny Randall. How are you, Lenny? I, got, I am blessed with no stress because I got a future Oakland A, Chris Cabrera from Miami. It'll be drafted oh. this year uh, to, to be a pro. And he's a heck of a player in his family. He's got roots. His dad and uncle were in the pro ball. His dad was a basketball player coach as well. I think he's still coaching basketball and baseball. Am I right, Chris? Yeah, yeah. And he's uh, coaching basketball at what university? Uh, college in Florida? Uh, he coached high school at Barber Goldman. Yeah. He coached there for about 20 years. And now he's a college coach in a college? Yeah, well, now he's running uh, an academy. For, oh, academy. Uh, oh. Yeah, local kids, you know, training mm-hmm. academy. Right. But it wasn't it one of the colleges, though, it was a junior college where he was a basketball coach and baseball coach or something like that. But the point is, he's a sportsman, and I love it that he crossed sports because they're all related. And I wish I could make Kaepernick a pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> or LeBron, like like Michael Jordan did, you know, switch sports. What the heck? TiVo, switch sports. Benny, <laughs> as, a, as yeah. a coach, a trainer, what are the advantages and disadvantages of picking one sport and sticking with it or um, going from seasonal sports, going from the experience of playing basketball, football, and baseball? Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages? I, I, I watched Kobe at a very young age at 9, 10, 11 in Italy in Rimini. He was a heck of a soccer player. He didn't really need the NBA. I also saw him throw a baseball, and he threw a basketball and a baseball the same way. So I look at Bo Jackson, I look at Deion Sanders, and I look at Tebow, and I'm like, why aren't more kids playing two or three sports? It's because travel ball has ruined the system. I like travel ball, but don't let it interfere with your basketball season or your baseball season or your soccer season. Just switch sports. Just go season to season to season. To do year-round baseball, you could burn out. I'm seeing a lot of kids quit. Now they're doing BMX riding and, and motocross because they just baseballed out or they're footballed out. Uh, you know, they need to change. Change brings about better muscles, better friends, better hand-eye coordination, and then you recover. You could take a break, go swimming, go, uh, you know, hiking or go, go boat riding. You, you could burn out, so you got to know. Pick two, and then take a break. And as today's coaches, they don't let you pick two two sports. High school coaches want you all year. They don't want the baseball coach and the football coach to ever meet. I had great coaches. Frank Cush and Bobby Winkles would let uh, J.D. Hill and Danny White and Bob Wills and all, us do two sports, help the university. You saved them money. We don't, were like heaven. we don't hear much about your football career. What was that like? Oh, my gosh. Ever? I was a Hall of Fame football player at Arizona State. I still have seven records. Humbly, I've been blessed to play football with a great institution. I have some of the greatest players in the history of, base, of uh, football. They were football and basketball and baseball players. You know, Danny White was a great quarterback. He was a heck of a second baseman. <laughs> you know, J.D. Hill, Larry Walton, Bob Brunick. I, it was 150 guys. That'd be all day. Jeff Pentland, who taught Sammy Sosa how to hit. I mean, there, there are guys that, you know, I can rattle, rattle off names like, you know, Kenny D'Angelo, Dick Davis, uh, Sal Bando. I'll be here all day. These, they were two sport athletes. Reggie Jackson Tell came to the state as a football player. Chris really well. And yeah. he was Chris Sal's and younger was brother. I got to meet him again. in the minor leagues years ago. Um, nice guy. Chris was a second baseman and a, and a, and a catcher. So how do really? you do that? And how many guys can do that? Like Bridgio, remember uh, the logo? Yeah, I was, was going to say, very few, yes. Um, yeah, he goes on to the Hall of Fame, that does Biggio. Um And you would think it would be the other way around. He'd make the, you would think that there are so few catchers that can hit that baseball wouldn't allow him to go to second base. It, it's amazing that a lot of catchers, you know, 
See, we grew up where we had to play three or four, five, six positions. That was like a must. If somebody just went down with Cabrera on your team right now, Chris, if you go down at first base or one of your teammates goes, you can play outfield, am I right? Yeah, of course. Now, can you play third, too? Like, we, we, uh, we were talking about Martinez and Big Poppy, first baseman. And, uh, the Martinez was third baseman, first baseman, even though that we know they were great hitters. But in an emergency situation, you can go to, what, center field, left field, play third base, play first? Yeah, I, I throw left-handed, but I could play all three positions in the outfield, first base, you know. So, that's, that's big. I played on a team that had a left-handed kick. <laughs> Which yeah. would you prefer to play, Chris? Um, I feel more comfortable in the outfield. I like right field the most, but, you know. Uh, okay. All of them, really. I, I enjoy all of them. Lenny what do you know? Six, six, six. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Lenny mentioned that you were drafted. Was it was it really the A's that drafted you? Oh no, I, I have not. I yeah. haven't been drafted yet. He, he will be drafted by the A's. Will be drafted. He okay. Will be. Good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nothing wrong with he, that. Um, uh, he's a pros- he's a prospect, not a suspect. He's a prospect. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Which team, if you had to just pick a team that you would like to be drafted by, money notwithstanding that, the choice, you know, the position you're drafted notwithstanding, what team would you like to wear the colors of? Um, I'd, I'd probably have to pick the Marlins just because I'm from Miami, you know. It mean a lot to me to wear Miami across my chest and you know represent the city. Gotcha. Uh, what was your first Marlin game like? Well, who took you and uh, what do you remember? Uh, as far as I can remember, I remember I, I would always go to Marlin games when I was really young with my dad. I remember okay. specifically the 2003 playoffs when they won the World Series. We went to a lot of playoff games. We, the one where uh, Pedro Rodriguez, the collision at home plate where he hung on to the ball to uh, win the division yeah. series. I remember that. You know, I remember yeah. I remember those vividly. Well, you have a history <laughs> in Texas with Pudge Rodriguez, don't you, Lenny? Yeah, we just got inducted and retired our numbers in the Hall of Fame in Texas uh, three weeks ago. And it was cool. fun. Watching him, because I, I, I always think of that Marlin game more so than the Texas Ranger game, when he had the ball and the guy had the collision and he got up and he shook the ball, and he shook the ball, and he shook the ball. That I was getting into that. I was that was intense. I thought he was gonna slam dunk the ball after it. <laughs> that wow. was a, that was a Marlin moment. That's historical. Great stuff. Wow. Um, were there other sports in your life? Growing up, that you might have gravitated to, Chris? Uh, really, just basketball because uh, my dad was a basketball coach, so I was always around it. But uh, I love basketball. Baseball was always, you know, number one to me. Good. So what do you know, Chris? About six two. You, you could play. You could play twenty four seven. You know, three sixty because of the the weather. Exactly. Yeah. Chris, how tall are you now? About six two, two twenty. Six feet. Yeah, about two, two oh five, six feet. Okay. Perfect. So I want you to stand tall like Ralph. Ralph is about six four, two forty in my mind. Uh, and I'm Scandinavian. I'll have you know. <laughs> <laughs> so stand tall. So always stand came tall. came over on an Italian fishing boat and uh, made oh. his his way. In this country, so <laughs> there's all kinds of things you, people don't know about me. The Scandinavian yeah. part, I hide very well. I, I'll have you know. And <laughs> yeah. Lenny, yeah, this is always fun. Okay. <laughs> uh, where, where to tomorrow when we meet? Uh, same time, same radio station. Um, for the travails of the most interesting man in baseball, Lenny Randall. Grazie. Grazie. Where, where tomorrow we shall you be? Tomorrow I'm, I'm supposed to be in Palm Springs. 
Arms Strength, 1,700 kids, the principal of the cup fan, the vice principal of the cup fan. They threatened my life if I didn't show up. I'm training some kids to be at Sports Magazine called Sports Life Magazine. They're going to interview their current players on their school roster, football, baseball, basketball. We're going to teach them to do interviews, and then we're going to do a clinic for speed and agility with the whole school, how to run faster, hit faster, uh, catch a football. We're going to shoot all the fundamentals of two sports. Our 150 now, kids will be in the clinic. Want, if a parent out there wanted, and this is very serious, if a parent out there wanted to avail themselves of Lenny Randall's camps, of Lenny Randall's instruction, of um, the beauty of Lenny Randall. Anybody out there, how would they get in touch with you on your email? They could just go to LennyRandall.com and register. I have a registration sheet. And it's, I'm so cheap, it's like, yeah, at 20 bucks, sometimes I wage 10 or 15. You're not cheap, you're inexpensive. There's a big <laughs> Okay. And uh, then, Thank you. I appreciate that. It's it's <laughs> um, it's all how you think of yourself, Len, and I don't think you, you think of yourself as cheap. That's for damn sure. So you what, get us in this country, this world. You are on perpetual vacation. You are um, you live a dream life, um, as I do. Just. Uh, trying to keep up with you and talk to you. This is terrific. We'll be back, and um, keep listening, everybody. We enjoy it, and um, getting great feedback on this this thing we have going, Lenny. Um, um, Guess who called me? Al Cowan's American League MVP son. He's next. Oh. Wow. Wow. Very good. Cool. <laughs> Um, Chris, nice having you as a guest on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network at Lenny Randall's Hot Corner. No, oh, thank you for having me. Back, that. and we're going to follow you. I promise you that. Uh, great. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, hey, guys. Chris. I'll Talk see you soon. first week. <laughs> All right. I'll... Josh, Josh, Josh. Miami uniform would look nice on, on you. you got to... Keep dreaming about that because dreams have a way of coming true. They really do. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Chris, take that picture in the AC. Take care. Good night. Ciao, ciao. Have a great one. We are back. I am Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and I have the pleasure of introducing Lenny Randall's Hot Corner, and the star is Lenny Randall. How are you, sir? The star, sir, is the fans, Tifo. So in Italy, we say Tifo. So right, Stefano Angotti. I have my right. special guest. Stefano's from, you could say Bologna, but he's more from Venezia, because people don't know this, the beautiful, most beautiful water port and restaurants in the world. Stefano, tell them how you spell your name. And we're going to bring the whole radio station to Beverly Hills at the Dome Cafe uh, Restaurant in Beverly Hills. Tell them how to spell your name, Stefano. To tell you how Stefano, S-T-E-F-A-N-O. No, well, I had teammates, Ralph, that spelled it another way. <laughs> okay. Um, there are five ways to spell Stefano. Uh, um, one is... The other one is prosciutto. The other one is spaghetti. The other one is <laughs> the most important one is baseball. <laughs> is baseball. Lenny, how yes, did sir. you come to know Stefano? How it? Um, how were you? How did you meet initially? I had a break. I'm gonna let Stefano explain. I do camps and clinics around the world. I happen to go to his city, his team. And I made everybody get dirty. So, Stefano, take the story and, and run with it. Oh, well, uh, Lenny was probably, without his hesitation, the most amazing uh, player I've ever seen, I've ever experienced to watch play in Italy, what a, what a, what a play there. 
the plain days when Lenny Randall was coming at bat was a problem, especially if he had more than one cappuccino. Flojo, Edge, whoever. 
when you're running track and you lean forward to hit the tape, and your nose right. is going to hit the tape, whoever hits the tape, even the horse, secretariat, whoever hits the nose first, hits the tape, wins the race. That's right. So with your weight going forward, you can carry your momentum that way and still be successful. Also, a third baseman or a second baseman or a shortstop will be afraid of you going head first because they think you're going to tackle them like exactly. the NFL, like a football player, like a soccer player. That's an aggressive play. It's like, all right, he's going to break my knee, or he's going to break my leg, or he's going to hit me in the stomach, or my nose is going to hit his chin. It's you know, they have a field factor. It's more aggressive to come in spike because you have, a, you have a helmet. You're wearing a helmet, so it's yeah. that hurts. It's more, it's more, 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 uh, more. I can't, I can't than believe spike. spikes high, though, wouldn't be more of a fear that, that an infielder wouldn't feel fear the spikes coming in first. Uh, the spike is obvious. It's so obvious. When I go in to break a guy up with my spikes up, like Frank Robinson taught us to do, kick a guy, make him throw the ball in the outfield, make him throw it off the bat, that's like a, a, a terrorist attack to actually break a guy's leg, to poke him and spike him in the stomach. That's that. intentional. That. You know, you don't, you don't, yeah, you, guys don't like that. It's not, no one likes to see a yeah. guy maim or break a guy's leg on purpose. No. No. And that's well, and then, there's, then there's the Utley rolling um, entrance to second base. Let's put it that's that a, way. That's uh, a Hal McCray, Baltimore Oriole, and um, Ruggiero Bacalamani, and uh, all of the uh, Nesuto players, Bella, Stefano Benicia. Uh, <laughs> hey, let me clarify something. Um, if I could just take a second and go back to a, a few days ago when we chatted, you mentioned that Ted Williams implored you and all of you guys to bunt against shift. And I'm wondering yeah. whether or not you even are aware that Ted Williams not once in his career gave in to the shift. Did he talk about that? He did so did Frank Howard, 330 pounds, 6'8". He bunted. Dave Winfield bunted. Dave Kingman bunted. So, Dave so, Kingman. Ted Williams did bunt. But, you know, Ted Williams' brother was just a single. It wasn't a double. A single a single, you know. It wasn't like big hey, news. By the way, Dave Kingman could have been one of the great – he was a great athlete. He pitched at USC. He was fast as hell going from first to third. I mean, once he got up ahead of steam, he, he had those long strides, and they, he was your teammate for a while, wasn't he, Lenny? Yeah, and also there's a guy in Italy named Paolo Ciccaroli. Paolo Ciccaroli. Yeah, and, 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 and manager for the Rimini. Yeah, he, he, they, they were saying. He just won the championship. Yeah, world, world champion in personality, world champion in baseball, built like Kingman, hit like Kingman, stayed in Italy. He's like Calabello. Remember Calabello played with Toronto Blue Jays? Correct. Huh? Chris hey, Calabello. Man. Remember him, uh, Ralph? Chris Calabello. I do. 30, I do. 30 home very, runs. Very well. It was really, for Kingman. no other reason than that great name. He, Kingman? <laughs> Calabello. No, Calabello. 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 <laughs> do you remember John Bacabello with the, with the Giants? Yeah, I remember him. And pick a pick, pick the long. <laughs> right. Boy, I thought of him today. P, Picholo coached in the minors with yeah. uh, with the A's when uh, when I was doing tops, ah. and it was just about the time that the union started taking over, and he yeah. um, and tops and the union came up against each other. Um, yeah. Let me ask you about the players' union. What what was the I was asked to tell Tony D'Angelo asked me to ask you about Elliot Maddox and the union. Oh, wow. and, and okay, let me let me give you a little history. Baseball, Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball don't like guys that got degrees or went to law school, like Pete Broger, myself, Elliot Maddox. Uh, there, there's, I can name ten guys: Steve Greenberg. They called us clubhouse lawyers because the team would always vote us to be player representatives because we went to college. The rest of the guys didn't have their degrees. We read more books than them. So some guys were jealous of it, 
And some owners hated it. So Elliot Maddox had a law degree, and he was a center fielder who was brilliant. And he would say before the game, and I kid you guys not, why is there a hole in center field? Can we cover that up so I won't break my knee? <laughs> okay. And then you go as a law student, that's a lawsuit. And they went, oh, Elliot, just go ahead and play. It's a water drain. He goes, okay, I see that it's a water drain. I understand that. But we're in freaking New York, and it hardly rains, okay? He says, and we're in Texas, and it hardly rains. So every city that I go to, I'm looking to not break my knee in a water drain. And if not, my attorney and my law firm will sue you bastards. <laughs> Do you know that's the very drain that Mickey Mantle broke his knee in, in the 51 World Series? Uh, that's right. Ian DiMaggio went after a ball that Willie Mays hit, and he screwed up his knee uh, yep. really bad. Well, uh, Elliot actually screwed up his knee, Stefano and, and Ralph, and he actually had a right. knee surgery. And, and it happened in New York, and it happened in Texas. And he sued Major League Elliot, Baseball. He won $3 million suit. The Yankees the and the Mets, um, and you did as well. When were you teammates with the, with the Yankees? We were, we were te- okay, let me tell you a little inside scoop. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to go ahead and get it out. I loved his sister. She was awesome. She was like Tyler Banks and a little Beyonce. <laughs> That's how I met Elliot. His sister was the the, the, the wild thing. She was awesome. So I said, Elliot, I really don't want to date your sister, but I'd like to take her to dinner with us, you know, because most guys don't like their teammates to go out with no relatives. So I end up meeting Elliot through his sister, and then we went out and became teammates with the Texas Rangers for three years and with the Yankees. Yeah, uh, real, real quick. And before that, guys, we played against each other in college. He went to Michigan State. I went to Arizona State. They would all come down, the whole team, from Michigan to Arizona, because Arizona, 120 degrees, and Michigan, it was, it was 40 below. So they stayed two weeks. Elliot stayed down there with me and the Arizona State baseball team. His whole team stayed down there with us. We met prior to pro ball, and I well, found out then that him and Steve but... Garvey were studying law. Oh, wow. So that – and – that's where you guys came up against the U- the union with Elliot. Yeah, and then we end up being teammates with Ted Williams in, in Senators, with Washington Senators. Ted traded five guys away to get Elliot and Denny McClain from Detroit. Oh. Elio Rodriguez, Brinkman, and Elio Rodriguez was at one hell of a third base. He was up there with Brooks Robinson and Nettles as far as uh, glory with the glove. He was awesome. Brinkman was pretty good defensively, too. Brinkman was heck of a defense. See, a lot of people don't know this, and Stefano knows this. Stefano was a complete player. He was a great defensive player, and then he was a good offensive player, kind of like Bochy, you know. But the thing is, some managers want you to hit 250, and some managers want you to hit like Johnny Bench, and not everybody can do with Johnny Bench and catch. So you have to depends on the manager and what, what your ability is. Defense is more important to me for a catcher because they're actually running the game. And if you look at all the catchers that are managing teams from Sosa to Girardi, Joe Torre, you know, the list is like humongous. Uh, everybody's a catcher. Even the guy with St. Louis Cardinals, he's a catcher. So they kind of know the game and they're in the game more. And they're going to take away some of their offense. Why? They're getting hit by foul balls. They're taking concussion hits. They're getting balls off the knuckles. They're getting balls off the cojones. Now, guys like Stefano had four balls. They didn't. It didn't hurt them. <laughs> right. My my worst fear was the walls. <laughs> the walls. He ran in the walls, but had no balls. So had a lot of balls. Oh, Stefano, how did you go from baseball to cooking to to being a restaurant here? Uh, well, you know, uh, playing in Italy was not making a lot of money. So when I retired, when I came to America, I retired. I had to go to find a job. And, you know, back then that was illegal, so I needed to find a job that would allow me to get some cash every day. And so I embraced a restaurant for a year, and uh, the rest is history. Not only that, he has a Rawlings collection. I'm going to post it on your site. He oh, had yeah, some of the like best that. watches, accessories, everything the Major League Baseball's made, he owns. He has a piece of. Even 
the bat to great to Mickey to Joe Matt. So, and some, some of the stuff you have in your memorabilia as well. It's amazing what he has his collection around from the Yankees. Yeah, He's a Yankee I'm, I'm, I'm the one that I'm the one that uh, um, invented the gold baseball. You know the the 24 carats gold leather baseball. Oh wow! They use for the money ball. They use for, for the, the money ball and uh, for the home run home run derby. Yes, and you yeah, invented my idea. That was my that was that's my project. Whoa. I'm going to post the pictures and throw it on your site. Yeah, it's about a $5,000 ball. <laughs> wow. Nice. Yeah. Hey. And, and he just happens to cook, okay? <laughs> and I just happen to cook and work like a mad dog, yes. <laughs> well, is the restaurant business uh, thriving the – with the economy the way it is, with the world the way it is, or has it been affected? Well, uh, restaurant business is always unpredictable. You have uh, uh, you have uh, um, uh, you know in the city you have about fifteen restaurants that works as a pound uh, people like crazy, and then the rest are but the rest are. You know, surviving, making, making their, making their, their, doing their bill, paying their bill, paying their dues. Uh, restaurants is always, how can I say? I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's, it's thriving. He's on Rodeo Drive, Ralph. He's on Rodeo Drive. Oh. Rodeo Drive, every third person's a millionaire, okay? Yeah. Every third person's from Hollywood, okay? Every fourth and fifth person is hanging out well, taking pictures of people walking by the restaurant. They have operators, drivers, limousine drivers, and special hairstylists coming into his restaurant. Okay, well, there's a group that came in one day. Amy and we came there from the World Baseball Classic. We brought some people in from from the Dodger Stadium there and want to make that a regular event. And these ladies were classy hairstylists, models, you know, ten star, right. better, better than Gazelle. And their friends. That's why Latoya Jackson was here every day in that night. Yeah, Latoya Jackson, uh, the the manager, man, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know the guy with the hard chin. What's his name? That oh yeah, quit. that's right, that's right, that's right. The yeah, 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 yeah. It was here. What's his name? Ah. The one before Mike Thompson. What's his name? Come on, Peter. I mean, uh, Ralph. You know his name, right? Oh. Uh, Cower. Something Cower. Oh, the coach. Um, the coach. Yeah. That's mad. The head coach. Cower. With the hard chin, with the hard mouth, you know, that guy. Anyway, yeah. he he comes to, yeah, he came to his restaurant. I'll send you some pictures. And, he, and he's had some quality food. I mean, it's phenomenal. You know, five-course meal, Beverly Hills, Rodale Drive, it's like being in Italy. He makes you feel like you're in Venice. Now, he's from the water town of Venice where feet, riding a gondola and eating on a boat is a very everyday thing. Okay. So. That didn't just start. You didn't just come over and, and have a five-star restaurant. You had to work your way up. Who greased the way oh, for yeah. you in the restaurant business? I'm sorry, again. And who helped you when um, along the way in the restaurant business? Who do you? Oh, who God. was a mentor to yeah. you? My legs and my will and my will to survive. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, I started. I started my career at Valentino Restaurant in Santa Monica, which is, which was, which she still is one of the top Italian restaurants in the country and one of the most important Italian restaurants in the world. And I began there as a as a bus boy, then promoted as a waiter, then captain, then maitre d, then general manager. And and, uh, and his brother, out. his brother as well. His brother is awesome. Called Marion. He's another restaurant there, which is awesome. His brother's restaurant is phenomenal. Ralph, if you ever get off the hill in beautiful Alameda, come to Beverly Hills or Dale Drive. I'll take you to his restaurant. Oh, I can't wait. Um, I'm a Beverly Hills kind of guy, a Rodeo Drive kind of guy, <laughs> don't you know? We'll pick you up at the airport first class. You can bring uh, no, Holly Berry. Holly Berry. Pick me up at Greyhound. Holly Here's Berry. Here's another thing you don't know about, about me, Lenny. Did you hear that, Ralph? Oh, that. Holly, Holly Berry. Is Greyhound don't even fly. <laughs> <laughs> but, Lenny, you mentioned, 
Lenny, you mentioned yeah. Holly Berry. Holly yeah. Berry was my neighbor, my next next door girl. Yeah. The girl next door. Right. When I moved here to America. I rented this beautiful apartment at the Tuscany building. And there was this this beautiful girl with two dogs, and uh, so, so, so we got to meet and talk, and blah 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 blah. And years and years later, when she was married to Dave Justice, yeah, uh, she came to the yeah. restaurant of Valentino, and I look at her and I go, "You you used to have uh, uh, two dogs, right?" And she goes, "Yeah, barking, annoying, bark, dog." <laughs> Yes, yes. You used to live at the Tuscany building. And then she goes, you scare me. Who are you? And I said, Holly, this is Steph. I was next door from you. Oh, my God. And then she looked at David <laughs> and she goes, you see, this guy knew me when I was nobody. <laughs> <laughs> What's amazing is Ralph's, Ralph's fiance is named Tolly Berry. I gave her that nickname, Tolly with a T. Oh, no, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, let me... I, you know, in between our talks, I have uh, questions come up, where, and this is totally off the subject. My mind drifts. Where did you live when you played with the Mets? Did you live in Jackson Heights? I started off at Jamaica State Queens by St. John's University because Jack Kaiser wanted me to stay near. I was on his Olympic team. Jack Kaiser was the president of the baseball and the athletic director at St. John's University. So he goes, when you come in town, I'll take care of you, feel comfortable, and try to stay near the stadium, near the campus, so you can get in and out of the the park quick and get home quick, because driving to New York is atrocious. So I stayed near you know, his suggestion, and, uh, and then I moved to Stanford, Connecticut. After I got a year in, I moved out, because Tom Seaver goes, you don't want to live in Jamaica State. You don't want to hear everybody telling me where to live. He goes, you want to come out to Stanford and live near Georgetown, get away, have Watch deer in the morning and watch bear eat all your food, all your fruit and get trees. <laughs> so I moved out to oh, Connecticut. Yeah. Then, then but, Willie Mays goes, nah, you're living too far. Minutes, you're out of the city. You're over the bridge and out of the city and uh, some good living. So Yeah. In, in the off season, it was phenomenal because of the snow and the, and the train. Taking the train in every day was fun for some people if you like getting on the train. I was basically a driver because I was a California guy who loved getting in the cars and driving the, nine, the 95 North. It's kind of like right. going on the Autobahn in Italy. When you get on the Autobahn in Italy, you drive as fast as you want until they catch you. <laughs> so <laughs> I, it was like that in New York. You drive as fast as you want, and the police really didn't care. They just like, ah, oh, what the heck, he's no, not a criminal. And they had a little system where you put a $20 bill with the driver's license. <laughs> No, and you give them tickets. I have to give them tickets. I go, officer, trooper. Oh, that's I got good, four that's tickets. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's when I'm in Beverly Hills, I go, I got four tickets or four meals at uh, Dom's restaurant. You want to come or you want to give me a ticket? <laughs> <laughs> Lenny, you're playing the game of life. And, it's a beautiful uh, thing. It, it's a beautiful thing, absolutely. What number did you wear with the Yankees? I wore whatever was left because they had like six. <laughs> all, all the numbers were retired. They were like, okay, it couldn't be one. Billy Martin was one. That yeah, couldn't start, be two. They're going to start cause... playing, playing with, with, with the signs. They have no more numbers left. Oh, man. There was not too many numbers left, Ralph. I had num- num- 99 was almost gone. It was gone. Well, just, I told uh, Reese, I said, Reese, just pick a number. Just throw out some dice and see what shows up. And he goes, 34, you could have it until somebody gets traded. <laughs> All right, let me ask you this, Lenny. You are not yeah. intimidated by much. As an amateur, yeah. you were uh, a terrific football player, baseball player, Arizona. You came in, nothing bothers you, really. Were you kind of moved when you walked around the monuments in Yankee, in Yankee Stadium? Um, did that get to you at all? What got to me, what, I took a day with uh, Louis Tian. He was my teammate, pitcher Louis Tian. I said, Louis, I bought some skates. I want to put on some skates. We put on some roller skates. And I said, let's just go all over the stadium, every floor, every aisle, because I don't want to walk it, because <laughs> that's a lot of walking. 
I said, so I bought some skates, and we'll do the whole stadium. We put on the skates. We went to Joe DiMaggio's private locker stash, guys. His private was Ray Negron, who was one of George Steinbrenner's personal assistant. He goes, I'm going to take you guys to some places you're never going to see, and no other player will probably see them. I think only Peter Goldenback, myself, and a few other people have seen me. This is his actual locker, actual uniform, actual shoes, actual bat, actual glove, everything there. And then there's Mickey's room, and there's Phil Rizzuto's stuff, and then there's Yogi's stuff. And I'm going like, okay, what about the rest of the tour? He goes, dude. I could stay in there a whole week. I could have stayed in there a week in four rooms. But we we finally had to go. We went to the to the monuments and we went to you know a site where so and so hit a home run. Mickey Mantle hit 555. How do you hit a 554 home run? What kind of tape measure? Who's the tape guy? How do you hit a five? What was it? Was his back court? What did he have for dinner? Was it Babe Ruth donuts? Was it Dunkin' Donuts? I want to know a guy. What does a guy eat to hit 554 foot home run? And I'm and, doing deep, and be 511 only. Oh my God! And I'm happy to hit one 301. Okay, <laughs> 301 feet. It's in the corner in the line. He was. It was amazing history, guys. That franchise. If you play there one day, a visit as a fan. It is the most awesome museum in the history of mankind, and they never should have torn it down. They should have left it as a museum. That place is I mean you I could hear I could hear Willie, Willie, Willie. Remember the catchy man I could hear. Mickey, Mickey, Mickey. I, thought, I was hearing little angels going, Joe DiMaggio, DiMaggio, DiMaggio. All right. I felt right, like little you. angels were flying around the state in the in the uh in the and T I was getting nervous. T I was going, Oh my god, I'm gonna be deported. <laughs> I should be in here. <laughs> He said the Boston uh, me, Red Sox have the this, Boston Red Sox this, have this, nothing this, like this, nothing this, like this. this Boston doesn't have that. He said when ears. Boston got rid of Babe Ruth, he put the Yankees on the map. Oh yeah, and you know that Boston's the the owner of Boston sold Babe Ruth to the Yankees for the money to finance a Broadway play called Oh my No Nanette. That was no Nanette. Wow. But Lenny, Maybe. before we go, yeah. I got to ask you: Does this voice ring in your ear, um, even today? Yeah. Listen up. Even I can hear. Listen, listen I told up. my wife. I told my wife to record it. You know, because right. when he said he made a delay, guys. You know this definitely. When you hear a voice unique like Mike Bongiorno or like uh, you know Vince Scully, you hear. No, oh, Lanny, I'm in America for 30 years. I have no idea what you're talking about. Anymore. No, Mike Bongiorno uh, in Italy. He was a very oh, popular. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and Don Peterson. They, they were unique voices yeah, in Italy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, over I'm here, this guy, this now Batty, Stefano, uh, and, Don, and Donny. He took his time. He never hurried. You would sit there and wait for him to say your name. You get in the box, you're in the circle, and you're going, okay, he's going to say your name. Any minute now, you've got to get out there because you're shaking. Because you got now batting <laughs> number 34. Letting run. La, 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 la. Oh, and then beautiful. You, you start shaking like, no, I'm not going out. I'm not going out. You've got me all nervous. <laughs> all right. How about he was this phenomenal. one? Lady? Listen up. Listen up. Yeah. Go ahead. Now batting for the Yankees. That's it. 34, Lenny Randall, number 34. That's it. <laughs> is that it? That's it. That is he in the room? Is he in the room? No, I need to know. Me. Is he alive? That was, that's my only talent, Lenny. No way, Jose. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. You got to report right. that on my, on my phone one day. I'll just leave it there, and I'm going to tell him you're coming back from the – from the Michael Jackson zone. You'll be back. <laughs> All right. Well, that was, that was the awesome. voice of the Yankee. That was the true voice of God. Um, oh, yeah. Did you tingle when you heard that in, um, when you were getting up to bat? Right now, I just had to pull over. Okay, I'm driving. I pulled over. I can't take oh, it. Oh, no, I meant back then. No, but I, you're giving me chills right now, bro. I'm thinking about the moment. I can remember... I see Willie Randall's going to hit next, and then Bucky Dent, and then Pinella. I feel, I feel the lineup right oh. there. I just gave you the lineup. 
I just felt that right now. And then Reggie. <laughs> I just uh, I just had a flashback. I had to pull over. Don't do that, Ralph. Put it on my phone. Well, we'll, put, my we'll put that on your yeah. machine someday, Lenny. And, oh, my God. Um, all right. Let me, let me share this with you. Stefano, the most unique voice in Italy is who? Is it Mike Bongiorno or Dan Peterson? These American broadcasters most that move over. unique voice in Italy. Yeah. Maybe for, for the um, colorful expression, I would say Dan Peterson. I used to love listening to him. There was him and there was Don Lurio, but there was way before your time. Wow. <laughs> you got to look them up, Ralph. Don Peterson is straight out of Brooklyn, moved to oh. Italy, and became a greatest broadcaster in Italy. He's for basketball. I, I, basketball. Did an interview Nate, yesterday. Basketball. I did an interview yesterday with Donato Resta. Oh, that's my man, Donato. He's German, yeah. Italian. And, good man. And we waited for yeah, you to call in, and you didn't call in, but we, we talked for for a long time. He's a, a very, very nice man. We took him to uh, Stefano's restaurant from Germany. That's right. Beautiful. Check the we website. we got to do it again. Um, yeah. The interview is posted up there. Go to the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network um, page on Facebook. Call him, call him right now. <laughs> it's, it, it's on there right now. Hey, okay. listen, guys, this has been terrific. Uh, Stefano, I hope you will um, come back, and um, don't poison anybody in the meantime. <laughs> oh, but I'm going to get him drunk. Can I do that? You can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Comfortably Zone Radio hey, Network. Baby. The show is Lenny Randall's Hot Corner. Stefano, please come back to be serious. Um, and I'll come visit you on Rodeo Drive um, and class up the place for you. Hello, you got it. Hello. Arrivederci tutti. Bella giornata. We'll talk to you tomorrow, Leonardo. And... Uh, where do you go next? Where am I going to be talking to you tomorrow from? I'm going to call you from Palm Springs. I just got a kid, a full-ride scholarship at, Sh- at Shepherd University. I'm going to call that coach right now and see if he wants to go live. Beautiful. Can't wait for tomorrow. Okay, ciao, you ciao. Get prettier every day. How come black don't <laughs> crack? Let me ask you that, Lenny. I'm going to leave that alone because Stefano doesn't crack either, and he's Italian. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm just because I'm curious. I looked at a picture of you. You're only three. You're three years younger than me. You look like you're forty. You look like you're thirty-five years old. Um, Ma, okay, you know, I'm gonna tell him, Chef. Mangiare bene, bella nespula, e mare e sole e bevere un vino. E tutto bene così, è giusto. And you got to take a nap for four hours. Oh, that, that, <laughs> a nap for four hours. I sleep for hours. Stefano, record the prima and messaggero a mezzo dormito. And messaggero a mezzo dormito. Lenny, when you're talking about taking naps, it's like anything else. You've got to leave some for future generations. You can't take them. <laughs> leave some. No, you got to take a nap. Hello, my friend. Thank you again, Stefano. Grazie. My pleasure. See you, see you guys. We are back. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network and the host of Lenny Randall's Hot Corner. Is Lenny Randall? How are you, Lenny? I am blessed. No stress. Hopefully, I can pass this on to our guest, Clarence Thomas. Not the senior Clarence Thomas, Clarence Thomas, but the former Navy, SEAL, or Marine, I've got to get it right, from Texas, because they, they eat football for breakfast and dinner and lunch. They've got so three this kids. Has nothing to do with a can of Pepsi. This has nothing to do with a can of Pepsi, right? Nothing to do. I think, I think they, I don't even think they, I think they put beer in their cereal in Texas. I don't know. Oh, oh okay. Well, no, I... The other, the other Clarence Thomas, the the esteemed oh. justice. <laughs> but, well, you know, there's a singer also, Clarence Thomas, right, Clarence? You know the singer? No, no, his name is Clarence Carter. Oh, okay. I get you guys mixed up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Clarence.
us. It's very nice to have you on uh, Lenny's show and the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network Airwaves. Um, tell me about how you and Lenny got together. Uh, tell uh, tell your story, my friend. All right. Uh, first and foremost, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Uh, again, my name is Clarence Thomas. I've been in Marine Corps for 21 years. Uh, loving every minute of it, uh, that I, that I had the opportunity to serve this country. Um, secondly, well, I, my wife and I are from Texas. My wife is from Houston. I'm from Dallas. Um, and we have three boys, nine, 11, and 13. Um, we actually, um, got connected with the, the Randalls, uh, through football here in Southern California. Um, his son, Bradley Randall, uh, saw saw my boys and uh, took an interest in their their talent and, and and skills. So which was a blessing for us because uh, you know with the uh, Bradley being in the NFL, he added a lot of good value to what um, uh, what we were teaching our sons, not only on the football field, but just uh, hard work in general and trying to achieve your goals. So. Uh, that's how we got connected. We've been uh, connected with the Randall for about a year, and uh, we decided to do the, the, the program um, a few months back, and uh, we've been going strong ever since. Wonderful. You are very, very lucky. What a terrific family you hooked up with in the Randalls. And um, specifically, tell me about your prospect children. Well, uh, again, my uh, my three sons, Michael, Aaron, and Calvin, um, they're all athletes in general. Um, you know, a nine, eleven, and thirteen, and uh, you know they play we play football here in the Southern uh, California area, from running back to linebacker to wide receiver, and you know, um, just specifically just working on their skill set. And, and, and have have they ball. decided on a position that they're going to play? Is it? Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I have um, they, they, my, my, my. Uh, they play both sides of the ball, um, offense and defense. And I have two running backs and wide receivers. And on defense, I have two linebackers and a cornerback. Uh, so. Um, but yeah, and at this age level, it's definitely good to to play both sides of the ball or uh, different positions. So as you grow and mature and understand the game, you know, hopefully that'll work out for them in the high school and collegiate level. Uh, the amazing thing about his three kids, Calvin, the nine-year-old, is better than the twelve-year-old <laughs> at this point. He has really? no idea how great his natural ability is. You know how the younger, sometimes the younger one will bloom and blossom a little quicker than the older ones. Not that I'm saying it's going to be like that always, but at this point right now, his natural skill set is phenomenal. Lenny, well, are you an, uh, an older child? Is Herman older than you or younger than you? Herman is, is uh, the middle. Uh, Ronnie's the, the youngest. He's my you know, brother musician. They're all ball players and pitchers. More, more so baseball than any other sport in my family. Me, I was the only football player in the family, but all my uncles were football players. At Canadian League and NFL, play with the Rams, you know, Nate Smith. So I was lucky to be around the Rams in football at an early age of like 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I was with the Big Jack Bass and the Jack all those Hilliard. guys. Yeah, it, it rubs off. When a kid is around pros or professionals, it rubs off. If you're around a high school, great high school group of kids, it rubs off if you're in middle school. If you were a high school guy and you're around, let's say, SC, UCLA, Arizona State, or University of San Francisco, and you're hanging out with a, a great group of college recruits who go to NFL or NBA or doing world track, it rubs off on you. It just hey, kind of... Unless you're Clarence, it, Clarence Thomas's kids, and then all you got to do is hang with your younger brother, and you get the same effect. Yeah. I was telling him yesterday, I said, Clarence, you need to put the little ones, he's not little to me, but, you know, he's younger, but keep them together. I'd have all three of them on the same team. Cut down on the limo gene service. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know hey, 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 uh, Lenny, first and foremost, you know you're about to start uh, 
some riffraff in the household now saying that the youngest is right. Listen, I'm going to yeah. take you to the promised oh, land if I get mama's attention. I'll take you to the promised land. I'll take <laughs> you to the promised land. Tell mama that. Secondly, you know, again, you know, uh, the reason why we, we keep them separate because, again, uh, you know, it gives them an opportunity to find their, their own niche. Of course, they're going to continue to challenge each other, but it gives them the opportunity to, to find their own lane and, you know, have their own, the, you know, uh, set their own roots in their own programs and stuff like Players, that. So, yeah, play it, other yep. sports? Oh, of course. You know, uh, mm-hmm. the mother uh, and my um, my father-in-law, uh, the avid track uh, stars, you know, my my wife went uh, collegiate track, and her dad went collegiate track, and so we, of course, we we're a big track family, and we try to do uh, a little bit of wrestling, but uh, yeah, we we are in the off season, we we do track season and then football season, and then we try to keep it rotated and doing different sports that you know keep them versatile. Let me ask you this, Clarence: What would the family be interested in? If sports, if there were no sports, you guys astronomy, oh, is that right? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, yes, yes. Uh, my, I have a uh, my master's degree is in HR management. My wife is a school teacher, so education is always the driving force uh, in, in our in our household for whatever it is they choose to do. Right now, with them being so young and stuff like that, you know, they're really into. Uh, Becoming uh, jet fighters, and you know, uh, they, they love cars, and and uh, we even got some chefs in, uh, in in the family. You know, they love to cook, so you never know. One somebody might be uh, working for uh, Quarter on Blue or something like that one day. So you know, uh, we we try to keep them very versatile. You know, we lived in Japan for six years, and uh, uh, we sent them uh, to Japanese school. So you know, they speak Japanese when they want to. So you know how kids are, but uh, you know we try to we try to keep them well versed. And uh, again, the driving force is you know continuing their education and uh, allowing that to be the foundation and the root, you know, under God uh, as uh, they achieve their goals. Well, they're geniuses. No, they're little geniuses, Ralph. They're really smart, sharp kids. So I look at them as well, either Yale, Harvard, or or uh, you know University of Princeton or somewhere. <laughs> What I like is they're well-rounded, and, um, you know, if the athletic part doesn't work out, you know, there's life to think about, and even if the athletic part works out, there's life after the athletic part to think about. Now, Lenny, you've been, re- you've been out of plan right, for like 30 years now. So, I've been on track. God bless the situation. I mean, my family, my dad and mom. Like, I had a dad like like Clarence. You don't you don't do your homework. You don't play. <laughs> right. And so, how our whole how family has it. That? Okay. That, that message well, was real clear. You, you want to become a couch potato in my era. Beautiful. Lenny, you uh, every day you run in, you run into the most fascinating people on the planet. You bring them on the show, and uh, it's trippy for me to get to talk to you and to share your message of love, education, hard work, and um, spreading peace through, throughout the world, specifically baseball. I uh, I must say this is the first interview with a non-baseball, um, in a non-baseball situation, but, you, but you're a, a professional trainer. I mean, your son's a football player. How did Bradley become a football player? What, did he play baseball at one time, or was it just a matter of wanting to find his own niche being Lenny Randall's son? Bradley was around Griffey. Brady was around Larry, Danny, Danny Walton. Uh, he was around, you know, football, baseball, Danny White. He was around football, baseball guys his whole life. He was around Dion. He was around Brent, uh, Brian Hunter. He's around guys that most kids didn't get to be around. A-Rod, hanging out with him, picking up babes together. He's 10 years old and A-Rod's picking up babes with Bradley, using him as bait. <laughs> 
we, we, we had died. Isn't it, isn't it Lenny? It, it always comes down to it. There's that common denominator. It's love, it's education, it's peace, but it's babes. Yes, it was babes. And then Frank Cush, man, at, in the ninth grade, he was in the ninth grade at Arizona State. We took trips over. I'm in the Hall of Fame for football at Arizona State. So all my football guys, I'm closer to Larry Walton, J.D. Hill, Curly Colt. These are Hall of Fame guys. And we see each other. We have a different camaraderie than, than baseball guys. It's just a different group of guys. Football guys are better to be around than me. They're real. They have more fun. They're more enjoyable. They, they, they're kind of like Marines and military guys. Hoorah. We just kind of get it. That's why I like having guys like Clarence on the show because they're sacrificed all their lives for America and their families, and they, they really get it. They're football guys at heart. They're not – baseball guys, to me, are spoiled. <laughs> okay. Um, they're, like, they're like golfers. <laughs> they're spoiled. Well, they don't know what hard work is. They like don't know. Person, <laughs> um, it, it, they really are by comparison. Oh, my God. Guys. Where? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, Clarence. Anything you want to want to say? Anything you want to put out there uh, on internet, radio, uh, archived on YouTube, incidentally. So, um, for posterity, what what do you want to say to the world? Oh yeah, well, you know, uh, what I would like to say is first and foremost that. Um, my family, my wife and I, uh, my three sons are very, very blessed to have come in contact with uh, uh, the many wonderful people that we've come in contact with, i.e. the Randalls. And, uh, and I believe that no one is a success in life without the help of others. So uh, here in America, with everything going on and, and whatnot, um, I, I continue to pray that we come together as Americans and, and, and you know, find – our own uh, parodies uh, so that we can continue to be the great nation that we are. I appreciate the opportunity this morning that you guys have afforded uh, for me to be able to speak here on your show. And uh, Clarence, it, it is our pleasure. It is our um, pleasure. And uh, now I would ask Lenny the same question, but I, I know yeah, the no, answer. Yeah. No, I know the answer, Lenny would give it would be babes. But, and that's good, Lenny. I'm not, not throwing. I'm, I'm gonna let me explain it like this. When you're recruited, unfortunately, I don't know why it is, but it's always based in the in the in the, in the menu for some reason. For example, I was recruited to Arizona State by Reggie Jackson, and it was it was ball, books, and babes. Okay, and I said, now wait a minute. The tr- the cheerleaders have nothing to do with my recruiting. Why are you, Reggie? Jackson and Sal Bowman are taking me to this place called the library. Now, the library, I thought, was a real library because, I'm, you know, I'm naive. I'm from L.A. I don't know everything. I thought I did. So I go to this place called the library. It was a club. It was a disco club. And they said, if your parents ever call you, just tell them you're at the library. <laughs> uh, <laughs> very good. Very good. So I got to I got to find out real quick, do I focus on my books? Ball or the base, because the Blaze were a distraction. And then they would say, Frank Cush would say, they'll always be there. You don't have to worry about that. Just focus on your career, focus on what you got to do, and they'll always be there. Just make sure you pick the good one, like maybe Mother Teresa. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, it helps to pick the good ones. That's le- <laughs> right up there, 101, Babes 101. Pick the good ones. Uh, Clarence, Clarence knows he picked the good one. Clarence picked the hey, good one. Absolutely. And sometimes you have to pick a bunch to find a good one. And then when you find a good one, that's, you have all that fun of trying to find a good one. And then again, good is bad. And bad is good. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I down, Lenny? You you sound like beast mode up there in Oakland. You sound like the that's the Raider way. 
<laughs> you sound like one of the Raiders to me. <laughs> All right. See, I'm not in the suburbs of Alameda in your mind anymore. I'm right in the, I'm in the hood. But see, Clarence has a Texas Dallas Cowboy. Hi, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. I was just going to say. I was just going to say this is really fun, and what a pleasure to have you on the show, Clarence. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you guys again. Triple All right. And every Marine. Talk to you tomorrow, tomorrow, Lenny. All right, Marines of the world, hoorah! Thanks for helping America, Marines. Yeah. Yes, indeed, and the Air Force too. Let, I'll talk about my Air Force experiences with you uh, another day, Lenny. Uh, I serve God, country, okay. and the American flag. So, Buck Sergeant okay. Ralph Tycho, Travis Air Force Base, signing out. Adios, guys. Adios. Come on. All right. Thanks, All right. We are back. Lenny Randall's Hot Corner. I'm Ralph Tycho, Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And Lenny is here with a terrific guest. How are you, Lenny? I'm excited because Reggie Henry is a very famous lineman from Centennial High School who went on to great things beyond the call of duty for uh, entertainment and sports. Reggie Henry was a kind of like Rosie Greer back in the day when uh, Rosie was, you know, with the Rams. Well, our team at Centennial High School was like that. Reggie was one of the 6'3", 240-pound linemen who could have been a running back who ran a 4'6". <laughs> Whoa. But he Whoa. Uh, chose to go into – well, uh, that already will tell you was all four threes and four twos. <laughs> and you went on to Laverne College, am I correct, Reg? No, actually, I uh, graduated from California Lutheran. And oh, that was oh. during the era when uh, the Cowboys, uh, that was their training camp for 25 years. Ah, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, did you go pro at all? Well, I tried out, so but, uh, anybody who's ever attempted that, uh, particularly back at that era, it, it was more of a mental kind of thing. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, linemen in a defense world right. really looking for running backs. And, and uh, people are uh, uh, those positions, so. It was very difficult to make the transition uh, to the line in this in 1931. Wow. May I ask you this? What were some of the skills that you learned on the athletic field that were transcended into your successful business career in music? You know, the, the most important one was never to give up. Regardless of whatever obstacles that you ran into or um, even even when you were down, let's say, uh, 21 to nothing and you got two minutes left in the game, it's pretty clear you're not going to win, but you didn't, you didn't play like you were not going to win. You played like you were going to continue to, uh, in any moment, turn it around, tie the game and win it. Beautiful. The, that's valuable in life no matter what you do, no matter what stage of life you are, because the, there's a shifting tide, and sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. And that can right. be moment to moment, day to day, and uh, that's terrific. May I ask you what Lenny was like back in the day? <laughs> He's energized a bunny. He's a lot of energy. Uh, very great personality, uh, charm, you know, uh, um, big charm with the charm guys, uh, he's just a lot of personality, a lot of energy, great athlete. Um, um, I didn't even know he had talent for singing. I knew he used to try to do it in, uh, but, you know, back then he was competing with new Motown. So there's no way he's going to beat that. Sad, but. With Sad Bosley. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's got a lot of talent. A lot oh, of talent. Oh, my God. Um, but, 
He just can't get 9 a.m. in the morning straight. Well, let, let, me, let me get it straight. Reggie and I have been waiting, and I'm going to share this with you, Ralph. We loved your piano playing person and the lady coming on saying, Ralph's busy right now. Ralph, <laughs> Ralph, is a, is our, Ralph will be with you. Ralph is we have, Who's we have technical <laughs> difficult. We have technical difficulties along the line every now and again. Let's put it that way. So, um, but we get during the day. We get, always manage to get get together and uh, and do it. Um, are you still in Palm Springs? Yeah, I am. I'm in Palm Springs. In fact, uh, this week I'm going to share this with you, Reggie. It could be a special guest at the charter school. We're going to have a. 31 kids, writers, and uh, these writers are going to be like journalists. They'll be like our current, you know, Booyah Scott and uh, Brian Gumbel and, and uh, Walter Conkite got kind of guys update to, to, to right. the ESPN zone. Are they going to be journalists? And they're going to have 150 athletes that we're going to train, and as soon as they finish getting training, they're going to be interviewed while they're tired, while they can't hardly breathe. You know how that gay moment is when people want to interview and you, like, can hardly talk and hardly breathe, and people ask you right. questions <laughs> in this halftime? <laughs> well, we're going to teach them. You're in your face, and all you're doing is trying, trying to recover from your injuries, too. What is yeah, that exactly. like? You guys played football, and, um, Lenny, you can compare it to baseball. What are recovering from injuries after again not injuries necessarily but just the experience of cab wreck seven times in one day um how long do you, does it take to recover and um how many players are cut down by injuries um early on you know guys it could have been great anybody on your high school team that um falls under that category, you could both take Our hockey team is better than the Rams. We do have a lot of people, Ralph. The stadium is Go ahead, Reggie. Yeah, we grew up with the philosophy, are you injured or are you hurt? You know, and uh, we grew up with the philosophy, are you injured or are you hurt? You know, and uh, either way, you still keep playing. Um, and that was just the way we were, we were coached and trained. So, you you stop playing once the game is over, and I can remember I many. A, that you want to mention, guys? Anybody that uh, was instrumental in your advancement? Oh gosh, I, I got two people: um, Aaron C. Wade, who was the head coach, um, and you know he went on to be one of the first uh, black NFL uh, referees, and then uh, uh, Coach Brown. Um, he was a line coach, uh, and I, I've seen him over the last 40 years. I've seen him every year at, at a annual concert that I would go to. Uh, so those two are very instrumental as far as my development. i got to mention Mr. Shimo, Mr. Shimo who yep. was like a kamikaze pilot <laughs> yep. from Japan. Who are headband and go? What do you go? What did that mean? Get your ass in gear. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And if you didn't, he had a paddle that was as long as an airplane wing. Yeah. Well, did he ever? Did he ever answer my question throughout life? I've always wondered why kamikaze pilots wore helmets. Yeah, we knew he was serious about his. He was. He said, "If you guys don't do what I say, like the lineman or the running back didn't go through a hole, you get hit." He would hit you with the paddle. He actually had a paddle when it was legal to hit a kid. <laughs> right, right. Well, times are changing there. That would that would get you in front of a school board today, huh? Oh, big but, time! But, he, but we had it was a message there. It was the fear factor. You know, he he wasn't like brutal with it. It was just. Right, the thought was, of it. You know, some was, people like to grab Mark and look at you. It was a gym teacher yeah. mentality kind of thing. Right, right. Yeah. And, and we, it, it wasn't like you know, brutal. It was like, man, you don't want Shima to hit you. <laughs> you know, right. it was the all day, all day thought. Well, we got to deal with that. And there was another guy, Mister Thrill Pill. Now, yep. This guy was like a German Hitler. I hate to say it, but yep. Mister Thrill Pill, remember him, Reggie? 
Mr. Thrill Kill had the name of a war hero with a, with, with a bayonet, okay? Yep. And Mr. Thrill Kill was a line coach. You had him too, right, Reggie? Yep, sure did. And, 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 and you know, you know, know that. Yeah, and, and the thing that's really interesting is that, uh, uh, like, my dad was president of the Booster Club for many, many years, and they condoned it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, they, they were all daddies on the field. Yep. <laughs> sure they did. Had license to kill. What music, what music was paid, played in your locker room back then? A motor. To, to this day, I'm going to try to get Stephanie Spruill, who was, uh, I think she was a Motown kind of sort of. She was a, yeah. our, our singers at school were phenomenal. Our choirs and our cheerleaders were like, you know, the, the Rockettes. I mean, we had, we had top of the line ladies there. <laughs> In fact, it was so nice. Reggie can attest to this. They wore white go-go boots. They had a white and red outfits. They were like bikinis. Right, Reggie? I mean, and we had to concentrate at halftime, Ralph. It was not easy. <laughs> yeah. Right. In fact, when, as, when, as when no time. Just a social thing. We're about the same age. I think you guys yeah. are about three years younger than me. Our generation went through a lot of changes, not just the Vietnam War thing, the women's rights, the equalization of this, that, and the other thing. What what was the most stressful change that you guys, and this is just a general question, came across in your lives that the, they had to adjust to, that where the world was changing, and here you are. <laughs> and uh, I'm just uh, just wondering. I'll start with you, Reggie. Wow, that's interesting uh, uh, that you asked that question. Uh, I, I would have to balance. To know you a little bit, and uh, I thought that would be a good way um, to do that. Well, no, I, I, I mean, I was just thinking about that myself, and you hadn't asked asked that question. But um, I, I would say, for me, um, it's it's kind of repetitive uh, in two ways. Um, uh, can you hold on just a second, please? Yeah. Well, why don't you take over, uh, Lenny? Or- yeah, well, let me, let me put it like this, Ralph. Our generation went through so much because not only were we transitioning to go to college, you know, high school to college, Arizona State, Red University, that whole 70s, 75, 80 era was exciting. Musical change, you know, from the Jacksons to Elvis to Bon Jovi to Bruce Springsteen. I mean, it was rock and roll, Haven, Little Richard. Uh, the Beatles came over. I mean, it was it was a crazy era of music wise. Motown was booming. Everybody loved Smokey, Jackson Fine, Diana Ross, Marvin Gaye. So that music thing was even in the White House. It was in our in our locker rooms. I mean, even our coaches. And I, I mean, Frank Cush played the same music that you liked. You know, when we listened to the Grateful Dead or Jimi Hendrix and uh, that that whole Jefferson Airplane. You know, it was a great musical era. So that music would give us our mood for the day. Our mood was based on what was played on the radio. You're presenting Frank Cush as a real regular, you know, cool guy, just human being. Why did we Jackson... have to have morale. You know, music well, was a morale you, business. Why did you know. Reggie Jackson have so much problems with, with Frank Cush or vice versa? Reggie Jackson had problems with himself. He he was from a uh, a family where he didn't get a lot of love. He had a mom and a dad, but his dad was kind of hard nosed and didn't hug, wouldn't high five, wouldn't praise him, would always put him down. So he had a difficult time being accepted by that you know rejection, rejection. So in order to you know guys get rejected, like you got to double your ego, you got to double your swag, you got to do ten times greater than what somebody's saying about you or feeling about you. So Reggie always had a complex. So that he had to overcome that complex by hitting home runs, by being the center of attention, by being controversial, by being a pain in the ass. And this is just his nature. But underneath all that, he was shy, timid, and fragile. <laughs> like all of us. But it was a great screen. I mean, you can look at a, 
you can look at Michael Jackson. I'm just, I can give you 15 examples. Let's just say he was shy in public, right? But on stage, he was a terror. Okay? There are some people that just can't talk in front of people, or they just can't perform unless they get on stage, or they can't, you know, in the locker room, they're real shy, but they go on field. Ricky Henderson wasn't that cocky in high school, okay? He was, he came later on, and he was speaking in the third person. He go, right. I don't know what Ricky's gonna do today, but Ricky might kill a face. Go, which Ricky? The Ricky, the Oakland Ricky, or the, or Ricky the homie at, you know, with the, with the Yankees? It was a different personality. Don Natalie, yeah, Ralph, I can Ralph, give you Ralph, another deal. Ralph, Ralph, go ahead. Go ahead. Ready. Well, I was gonna give you another example. Uh, you remember Ken Stabler? Kenny Stabler, the oh, quarterback of no. the Oakland out, um, I live in the East Bay area, and I got to see Stabler up close and personal all, all those many years. We all followed the Raiders, and they were like mentors to us because they would come through, you know, like rock stars. They were like rock stars. And, and you look at Roman Gabriel was a rock star, up to Ferragamo, rock star, up to Jim Pluckett. You know, it's just that was an era of, you know, yeah, rebels and rock stars. You had J.T. Snow down there. J.T. Snow was terrific. <laughs> Was yeah. yeah. So Reggie, um, Reggie saw that, and he, he met these guys. I mean, when, when Reggie, were you ever with Barry Gordy, ever, or any of the staff members, or any of the, in the Rock? In the no, You signed all this as well? Quite a few. I said some of the artists that you were around you when your 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 transitions from sports into entertainment, what artists did I because you were jazz, pop, rock and roll, what artists did you uh, get the most from? <laughs> Lenny, is is Re- Reggie coming in clear to you? No, he's not. It's, it's uh, uh, like a airwave or ISIS. I'm coming trying to get in a conversation. Okay. I'm gonna try to. Is that better now, Reggie? Is, is it better? <laughs> I'm to... Okay. No, it doesn't <laughs> Peter, seem to be back coming through. Get in on the conversation. All right, Peter Dollenbach's trying to get through. That's probably why he keeps calling. Oh, pretty cool, pretty cool. How's exactly. Peter doing? Uh, exactly. We have a friend that just came from Russia. Uh, I told him not to go, but he left for Florida because Florida had the flooding. So he took off him and his wife, Wendy, to Russia for three weeks, and he just got back today. And we're writing a book together. It has to do with our movie. In fact, Ralph, I'll let you know about that. We're about to... Uh, in another week or two, we're going to start our major motion picture slash reality show slash documentary. And oh. uh, Reggie's musical people will be involved with that, and Peter will be involved with that as well. So uh, just very, thought I'd give you a little inside nice. scoop. <laughs> Has Peter arrived? Is he on? He's on today. We're going to be talking. In fact, I could click him in or call you back because he has a lot to tell us. Reggie, Peter going back. Well, I'll, seven tell times. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Why don't you? You know that um, I had the Peter Golenbach, Peter Golenbach University on this very station. Why don't you call the same number at 8 o'clock Sunday night, and we'll put you back on the Golenbach show. You've been on that before. Okay, and great. Okay. Is that a good idea? Great Can idea. You... Reggie. Yeah, that would be awesome. Okay, and uh, you bring Reggie with you, please. I oh, will, for sure. If Reggie's okay, not getting on a plane somewhere. <laughs> okay, well, that's 8 o'clock. I'm not getting on a plane. 
Okay. Re- right, Reggie's other residence is Mexico in a, in a resort, so I have to catch him when I can. You know. <laughs> okay, I understand. If you keep, if you can catch him, fine. Otherwise, yeah. please have him back uh, yeah. very soon. Reggie, I so yeah. much enjoyed uh, chatting with you. And um, Lenny, every day is yeah. a holiday, and tomorrow is Sunday in both of our worlds. And ain't that great? So long. Shalom and uh, and all that stuff. Well, all those those great Asalama Lincoln. How about I can give you, give you some? I give you. I'm so versatile, Lenny. You you haven't even begun to yeah. to see. If you're the most interesting person in the world, I'm the most dippy person in the world. How about how about that? So we we have Reggie, a, can you a bunch of dinner. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, thank you again. I'm going to hook this, uh, put this with the three or four other days this week that we spoke. And uh, this is great. We get uh, get to see what you're like, Lenny. And uh, your life is fun. <laughs> That's, it, um, wait, wait till tomorrow when Reggie goes over his notes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I kid about the fun part. Here's the most in- the most fun part is that you get to talk, you talk to the, some of the most fascinating people on the planet, and they're interesting and uh, communicative. And uh, I'm glad that you bring them on your show because it's uh, it's terrific. So we'll catch you on the flip flop, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. We'll, no show tomorrow morning, but we'll uh, eight, catch eight you tomorrow o'clock night. You on Peter's show, you, you'll be on. We got uh, okay. got a good show, got a good panel, uh, on you know coming together. We're going to talk about the shoe scandal, the the recent, oh, okay. and you know Peter wrote that terrific book on yeah. um, Balvano and all that. So yeah. I want to get your your take on all that stuff. It's been going on for years, hasn't it? Well, Reggie and I were recruited. Reggie, I don't know if you had any recruit violations, but we didn't. We looked the other way. <laughs> I mean, I saw guys getting cars, money, girls. <laughs> oh, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It, okay. In fact, you look forward to it. Uh, well, um, the times are not a changing. Then. No. Is well, it- social media, If we didn't have social media, Ralph and Reggie. We we didn't rat each other out either. It was like, okay, so I'm driving a Mercedes today. Is it for the day of the week of the year? I wasn't telling a guy. Come on. I, I was right. getting in the car with him. <laughs> I give him some gas money. <laughs> All right, shotgun. Driving around in a Mercedes trying to get yeah. gas money. <laughs> well, yeah, but it was, Reggie could tell you, when you go to the 91 from, uh, you know, a 60 freeway, L.A. to Compton, L.A., Long Beach, L.A. to Inglewood, L.A. to Hollywood, L.A. to Beverly Hills. You know, a burger and a fry is how we lived. And then we had gas money. That was it. <laughs> but gas was 30 cents a gallon back then, too. you got to remember that. But you had, you had buddies. Ready to have buddy and I. They were hoarders. They wouldn't give you gas. We'll go, well, will you buy me a burger? you got to do something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for a glimpse into the past, and we'll we'll be back uh, when we do. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and uh, please come back, Reg. All right. right. Be well, guys. See you soon. All right.